Our next session highlights the experiences of Odelia Bay as a lawyer, academic, and advocate who identifies as episodically disabled, and she is currently working towards her PhD at Osgoode Hall Law School. Her doctoral research examines how workers with episodic disabilities balance the competing needs of self-care and work. She has published on these themes in Canada, the United States, and the United Kingdom, most notably as a co-author of Law and Disability in Canada, Cases and Materials, the first disability law casebook in Canada. Before starting her doctorate, Odelia completed her Master's of Law at Columbia Law University, Columbia Law School, where she was awarded a graduate student fellowship with the Future of Disability Studies project at Columbia University. She also holds a Juris Doctor in English Common Law from the University of Ottawa and a Bachelor of Journalism from Toronto Metropolitan University. Odelia articled in Union Side Labour Law and is called to the Ontario Bar. She has taught several law school courses, including labor law and critical race theory. Prior to studying law, Odelia, Odelia worked as a broadcast journalist in both radio and television. Odelia, welcome. Okay. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, sorry, I'm just <laughs> experiencing time and, and all of what it entails in a very complex way today. Melissa, do you have my, my PowerPoints that you can share? Perfect. So um, I, I just, I know that my, my introduction was done as I'm kind of <laughs> running to the screen. Um, I did want to say thank you to Realize for the opportunity today to, um, to be part of the summit. I really appreciate it. Um, what I am sharing today is a work in progress, very much so. Um, and um, I'm excited about the next stage of my, of my research. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you more about kind of the general thoughts and where things are at and then um, and, and and we'll see kind of <laughs> collectively where where all of this goes from here. Um, so I wanted to start um, just by letting you know what I'm hoping to touch on in the presentation today. Um, I've tried to divide the presentation into kind of three basic parts, as I understand. Uh, the work that I'm doing. So the first is that I'm going to talk about law um, and this kind of law thing, what it appears to be versus how it actually operates. The second is that I'm going to talk about um, what I see as ongoing conflicts between the way that we structure our workplaces, our work-life balance, and what this means in particular for workers with episodes disabilities, specifically the pressure to produce against the needs we have to slow down and take care of ourselves. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the role of imagination and how we can perhaps use imagination to change the ways in which we work in the near and not so distant future. So what I'm sharing with you today draws on my work as a PhD student and as I mentioned before, it's very much a work in progress. This is a culmination of years of conversations, experiences, both my own personal experiences and those shared with me, piles of reading and so much contemplation. I feel sometimes like some of it's come to me in a dream um, or in dreams, I should say. And I don't mean to discount this kind of knowledge. In fact, I think that embodied knowledge, that kind of knowledge that we feel within us and in our bones is actually really valuable. In the next stages of my work, I plan to speak to more people with episodic disabilities to hear about their lived experience and what it means for them to actually perform the idea. You know, we talk so much about work-life balance. Um, I want to hear what it means to perform work-life balancing acts. By learning more about how we as episodically disabled workers negotiate these difficult moments 
where we're called to, to find some balance, we'll be better able to understand the nature of discrimination we face, as well as how, when, and why we decide to either care for our disability-related needs or forgo that care. Before I get more into my presentation, I think it's important to situate both myself and my project. I stand figuratively with one foot in the land of law and the other foot in the interdisciplinary world of critical disability studies. I also have relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis and I identify as episodically disabled. The language I use and the questions I ask are unabashedly informed by my perspectives and positionalities. Rooted in the land of law, I use the language of accessibility and accommodation, terms we've heard a lot about in the last uh, two days. The former places a positive obligation on employers to remove barriers in anticipation of disability. These measures are designed to make workplaces and other spaces welcoming and inclusive from the get-go without the need for a disabled worker to ever disclose or self-identify. The latter accommodation refers to what are often reactive changes that employers must make to remove barriers to workplace participation. And this happens usually after someone with a particular need has made a request or a human rights complaint. From the perspective of, of critical disability studies, this project is an exercise in cripping our workplaces. The use of the word crip here is not at all derogatory, but rather a political reclamation of our disability language and identity. Cripping refers to the process of centering disabled people's experiences in order to better understand and remove systemic barriers. In this way, a failure in quotations, or an inability to adhere to social norms comes to be regarded as generative and an opportunity for positive change. Who we are in the work that we do matters. It matters because it shapes what we experience and by extension, what we know. It makes me think of a book by Jim Ferris. He's a poet and he's written a book called The Hospital Poems where he shares about his childhood much of which was spent in hospital. Shortly after my diagnosis of MS, I remember reading his poem, Poet of Cripples. And in this poem, he writes about the poor normal ones. I remember turning that phrase around in my head many times, the poor normal ones. Could there be value in experiences of disability? And how do these experiences of illness and disability shape what we know and what we imagine. Imagination is immensely powerful. Earlier this month, I read a lovely speech by Alex Bommel who wrote um, for International Women's Day. She is a blind writer, theater maker, educator, and disability activist who's based both in Canada and the United Kingdom. And her speech was all about the power of imagination and how critical imagination is in furthering disability rights. She started with the Merriam-Webster definition that I have up here on the slide. Imagination is the ability to form mental images of things that either are not physically present or have never been conceived or created by others. In her words, quote, the power of imagination is all around us. To imagine turns the absent into the present a little miracle in seven letters, imagining. It has been one of the most empowering practices I've exercised throughout my life and work. And it remains at the core of my teaching and accessibility consulting. I start my sessions inviting everyone to imagine beyond the, the assumed. I'll return to some of Bulmer's thoughts a little later, but just as imagination can expand the world as we know it, an inability to do so can also contract it. I want to talk about the law, the law, <laughs> with a deeper intonation and a capital letter L. Um, the law is a strange thing. 
because we can ask what human rights laws exist in the form of statutes and case laws, and we can read and talk about what accommodations episodically disabled workers are legally entitled to. But the law as it appears on the books is seldom the way we actually experience it or the way that we produce it because you and I are legal actors making daily decisions about what is or is not allowed. And of course we are located within social contexts and shared understandings or misunderstandings of legal structures that shape how we experience episodic disability. This brings us to a concept known as legal consciousness. It's the term used to explore and understand the societal production of law. And what I want to know through my research is how people with episodic disabilities make important decisions about how and when to engage in self-care or ask for related accommodations based on their perceptions of the law, as well as their perceptions of how their employers understand the law, right? Two levels. So the questions they ask themselves might sound something like this. Am I actually entitled to some form of accommodation because of my intermittent pain? And next, will my employer actually be aware of my rights to accommodation? How a person imagines the answers to these questions will shape whether action sorry, whatever action or inaction they take. And I want to know how these kinds of imaginings impact a person's ability to make necessary self-care decisions. And so we come to the concept of radical self-care, which is attributed to Audre Lorde, um, who famously wrote, and I love this quote so much, I understand why it's actually turned into a meme out there. <laughs> she wrote, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. Lord wrote this as a woman with intimate knowledge of what it means to be a person with an episodic disability due to chronic illness. She was living with long-term cancer at the time. And she wrote this as someone who was trying to determine when, as she put it, stretching herself crossed a line and became detrimental because she would be extending herself. And so as she said, self-care becomes a political act, particularly in the context of employment, when time, energy, and most of all labor power is diverted from productivity to look after one's own well-being. Self-care in the context of my research is not about bubble baths and other baubles that we see advertised all the time and told to consume to cope with the demands of capitalist production. Rather, it's a reclaiming of Lord's radical crypt framing of self-care. Because the experience of episodic disability may include intermittent symptoms like pain, like fatigue, dizziness, nausea, weakness, depression, brain fog, even more. Self-care, the self-care that I'm talking about here, often looks like the ability to say no to the constant pressure to do more, be more, and work more. Radical self-care is not meant to extend to activities that may be regarded as self-indulgent or individually enjoyed, although some of them may be enjoyable. Instead, this kind of care focuses on managing preventing and responding to episodes of disability. And although it's largely an individual activity, self-care is something that can actually be seen as a social good. Um, I remember going over some of this work with a professor who said, nobody's going to want to hear about Foucault, but I'm going to mention Foucault anyway. Michel Foucault spoke about his conception of care for the self as he termed it, which he viewed as a practice of ongoing self-awareness and self-improvement that contributes to one's ability to actually participate as part of a, of a collective whole. So while the experiences of episodic disability may be inherently individualistic, I mean, after all, you can't experience my fatigue or take a nap for me, self-care as a practice is essential to finding ways to socially contribute 
and maintain citizenship. It seems impossible to describe episodic disability without talking about time. In fact, the word episodic means something that is limited in duration or occurring, appearing, or changing at usually irregular intervals. So to experience episodic disability is to experience time that is perhaps slowed, irregular, unpredictable, and sometimes cyclical. There is an ebb and flow, space for both anticipation and dread. Time is tied up in impairment, ability, and affect. This is crip time. To understand crip time, I think it helps to understand the flip side, the norm, and that is that there are typical experiences and expectations of time. Elizabeth Freeman, a cultural and queer theorist, has done a lot of thinking and writing about this idea of normal time. She calls it chrononormativity, and she defines it as the use of time to organize individual human bodies toward maximum productivity. So things like schedules, calendars, time zones, and even wristwatches inculcate forms of temporal experience that seem natural to those they privilege. We are taught to, uh, and now these are my words, sorry, we're taught to view these rhythms and rituals as neutral, and yet they measure productivity and citizenship in a way that's weighted against those of us who move in crip time. In the context of work, they inform when we are expected to start our working lives and end them, structure of our work day, our work week, and things like pay, benefits, and many other employment standards. But for those of us with episodic disabilities, we know that careers start, end, or pause at unexpected moments. Disability impacts how others perceive relevant experience, daily commitment to work ethic, or earned promotions, etc. All of these are exposed cracks in chrononormativity. Another theorist by the name of Alison Kafer has a really lovely way of explaining crip time and also the ways that it's transformative. She writes, crip time is flex time, not just expanded, but exploded. It requires imagining our notions of what can and should happen in time or recognizing how expectations of how long things take are based on very particular minds and bodies. We can then understand the flexibility of crypt time as being not only an accommodation to those who need more time, but also, and perhaps especially, a challenge to normative and normalizing expectations of pace and scheduling. Rather than bend disabled bodies and minds to meet the clock, crypt time bends the clock to meet disabled bodies and minds. Again, the realities of life with episodic disability become an imperative to reimagine work. The next slide, please. Self-care and crip time are evasive under human rights laws. These capital L laws do nothing to displace the imperative to work. In fact, they uphold and strengthen it. There is no right not to work nor is there any obligation on employers to ensure anything like work-life balance for employees, even when the life piece of that puzzle is so inextricably linked to disability. Instead, human rights law seeks to uphold the dominant imperative of predictable and productive work by making exceptions for outliers as opposed to widespread systemic change. And while there is clearly a right to disability accommodation, it creates a kind of fragmentation because many of the mundane subjective experiences of illness are ignored, disbelieved, or stigmatized. And so we craft the way we ask for accommodation as disabled workers. In case you can't tell, I'm a little cynical about the potential for transformative change that's rooted in our current laws of accommodation and accessibility. But then again, we have imagination. I'm reading a book with my seven-year-old son. Um, it's a series called Unstoppable Us. I don't know if you've heard of it. 
Um, it's by Yuval Noah Hariri. And the books are about how humans have taken over the world and how our decisions as a species have created the world as we know it. But also it's about the fact that just as we humans have made this world what it is, we can change it. Disability is contextual in that it is based on the barriers that we as humans create. We can also choose to change. In fact, we have. Four years ago, we were busy reimagining work in the face of a global pandemic. Pandemic life was extraordinarily transformative. We restructured our lives to prevent and reduce incidents of illness, disability, and even death. And while we were motivated by our collective best interests, many of the changes created more inclusive working conditions for episodically disabled workers. I know that there's tremendous pressure now to revert back to pre-pandemic normal ways of working, but I don't think that that's going to stick because we've seen too much in terms of what is possible, and it continues to fuel our collective imagination, which takes me back to Alex Bulmer's speech in which she concludes with the following. After we imagine, we act. Inclusion is a culture. It is not a feature or an afterthought or an accommodation. No coincidence that accommodate rhymes with tolerate, and they both reek of colonialism. Inclusion is a culture, a cultural reimagining, an enabling society that is everyone's responsibility and everyone's gain. Imagine that and let's build it. I thank Alex Vomal for these words, Wilmer, sorry, for these words. Sometimes I think that as folks with episodic disabilities, we feel great guilt for taking the time we need and for looking after ourselves. But these acts, while perhaps seen as failures of a kind, are not our failings. And our so-called inability to keep up is actually a radical act because it's in these moments when our bodies say no and expose neoliberalism's fault lines that change happens. So why shouldn't we acknowledge that we are also responsible for challenging norms in good and generative ways? for creating imperatives to imagine and innovate. And I wanna thank you for being here, listening and imagining with me today. Thank you, Odelia, for sharing your unique and important work. Thank you so much. We're so pleased to have you here today. And we'll take a few minutes to look at the Q&A. There's a comment I'd love to read out loud. I really appreciate that this session on radical reimagination comes after the one on disability justice. We have grown up in a deeply ableist world that we sometimes cannot see an alternative way that challenges the core of capitalism and neoliberalism. These two sessions really challenge us to view disability outside of the charity model. It challenges how we have existed and excluded various groups. A lot of the processes we turn to do not center disabled people, rely on medical models or individualism, and blame and thus limits our imagination of a just world for disabled people that respects their self-determination and expertise. Thank you for that comment. We Thank have another you. question that I'd love to uh, ask you. So, mm -hmm. Adelia, how does this look in a unionized environment when certain employees see themselves as entitled based on seniority? I have found the union structure has created a toxic work environment for providing employee accommodations. Mm -hmm. um, I saw, you know, that question as it was entered. Um, and it's something that I've certainly thought about. Um, I think it was mentioned in, in my bio that my background is in labor law. And in particular, I worked in, in union side labor law. Um, and I think that there's, there's, there's a tension there because what this comment is about is certainly true. Um, but I sometimes, I think that actually when we're in this kind of collective competition, um, 
and it can be really difficult for us to do as individuals with episodic disabilities. So I, I do look a lot to, to the allies and the people who have privilege to question these things. Um, but um, we have to question what it is that people, you know, like why these, these structures that are um, preventing the innovation and imagination and therefore inclusivity um, or inclusion of disability, what is behind um, this resistance? So when we're working with, um, with incredible pressures to be productive and that that's what's valued, when we're working with, you know, within um, constructs that have us compete for rights and resources, there's a, a real pressure to say, this is not fair if somebody else gets to have this kind of exception. But what we need to try to do is, I think, this is just how I've been thinking about it, how I answer the question, is flip the challenge and flip the question and say, okay, is it that it's that trying to make these workplaces more inclusive or whatever structure it is, is the problem or is it the root or is the root problem really the way that the workplaces are structured in the first place? Um, I don't know if I'm making sense, but I've had, for example, students ask me in a classroom setting, it's not fair. How is it fair if a student gets extra time on the exam when it's really difficult you know, material and I'm now at a disadvantage because they have the accommodation? And my answer has been, is it the accommodation that's unfair or are you in a, put in a situation of incredible stress um, and, and um, expectations that can't be met and that that's the root of the unfairness? So I don't think that it means that collectively we can't make that change and come to that place, but I do see that it's really difficult. We are all stuck within this structure that's making us all work in a particular way and value particular things that makes it really challenging when there's, there's um, as I say, a failure, <laughs> right? Right. And I really value you bringing imagination to the table today because that is how we create and build new worlds. Thank you, Adelia. Thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you.